today we're going to talk about all of the equations in astrophysics and we're going to talk a bit about the theory behind them and I based this off the A-level physics syllabus for the CIE exams but I think it should cover most of the core parts for all the boards. So I just want to start off by going through the basics. The most important thing is to know some of these terminologies. Luminosity, which is denoted by L, is the total power output of a radiation of a star. Imagine a star somewhere in the universe, and it's constantly giving out radiation. Every single second, it's giving out so much radiation, light, heat, all kinds of it. And so what luminosity is, is the total amount of the energy that it gives out every single second. And so understandably, the unit for that is watts. Um, the radiant flux intensity, on the other hand, is the observed amount of intensity or the radiant power transmitted perpendicularly through the unit area, which is measured on Earth. So that might sound a little bit confusing. What it basically is, is that the rays are going to travel outside and when it travels to us, it's going to have diminished by a lot. The power is going to be very strong over here because there is so much energy and it's so close by, but this is going to spread out and we're going to get a very diluted version of it. So, you know, it's the amount of energy that's measured on Earth per second, but also per unit area. Just to be fair, because we can't like measure the whole uh, diagonal of the universe. So it's per unit area. And so for this, the unit will be watts per meters negative two, if that makes sense. Now we can take a look at the inverse square law of flux. The inverse square law of flux is basically telling us that, well, you know that probably that the inverse square law is that the intensity is directly proportional to the original intensity divided by the distance squared. And that's because you can take a look at this. When the rays spread out at R, the area is A. At 2R, the area is 4A. At 3R, the area is 9A. And you can prove this trigonometrically as well. But what essentially happens is that the area is going to square as the distance increases, right? So the area is directly proportional to the distance of the uh, distance between the two bodies. And we know that the intensity is basically the energy over the area. So actually the intensity is going to be inversely proportional to the square of the distance. And that is the inverse square law. And for the flux, you know, just to be very specific for flux, when we talk about proportionality, there is a constant involved. And in terms of flux, the constant is 4 pi because of the fact that 4 pi r squared is the sphere surface area. And obviously in stars, the light is spreading out into a sphere. It's spherical. And so that's why we get the equation that the inverse square law of flux is that the radiant flux intensity, which remember that this is the um, intensity per unit area measured on Earth, it is going to be equal to the luminosity, the total initial energy, divided by 4 pi d squared, which is the area. So there are some assumptions that have to be made uh, when we deal with the this equation, inverse square law of flux. First assumption is that the power radiates uniformly through space, which is not true. Um, although light does travel in straight lines, um, you're likely to come across some areas in space where gravitational field is extremely sm extremely strong, like a black hole. And, you know, in a black hole, a light cannot even escape when it's sucked into it. But there are other fields that also have a very big mass. Um, and this distorts the space so much, it warps space so much that the light is slightly bent when it passes through it. So, you know, this equation does not account for all these things happening. But they definitely exist in the path of the light, especially if the star is very far away from Earth, they're more likely to come across these types of bodies. Um, it also assumes that there is no radiation absorbed between the star and the Earth, which, as you can probably tell, there are different types of things between the star and the Earth. There are entire galaxies in place, other planets, and they're also going to absorb a little bit of the energy as it falls on them. But it's ignoring all of that. 
But from this, we can basically conclude that the radiant flux is greater when the star is closer to the Earth, and also the luminosity is assumed to be constant, which is not usually the case for the stars. So they have certain phases where luminosity is greater, and then certain phases where it's lower, but it's not accounting for that. Now we can go into standard candles. So standard candles are astronomical objects which have a known luminosity due to a characteristic quality possessed by the class of object. The problem with luminosities is that when you look at the sky from Earth and you take a look at this star, this star is obviously dimmer than this star, which is much brighter. But you can't really tell if this star is a dim star that's closer to us and this star is a very bright star that's far away from us, or this is just an actual dim star with a low luminosity. Like, because distance is in the way, and distance affects the observed luminosity of the star, it's very hard for us to determine the true luminosity of an object from, from Earth. So that's why standard candles are very important. Standard candles, we already know what their luminosity is. And then so, we know their actual luminosity, and we know the observed luminosity from Earth because we can measure that. So we compare those two together and we finally figure out, using the inverse square law of flux, what the distance between this star and the Earth is. So once you know that distance, you know the distance of all the stars that are nearby that star as well. So an example of a standard candle is a C-feed variable star. C-feed variable stars brighten and dim at certain periods. This is due to the helium and the hydrogen in their atmosphere turning opaque as it is heated and cool. Uh, when it's cooled, it's going to turn transparent. So it goes through these like period oscillations where they brighten and dim. And so when we observe a star like that, we know this is a C-feed variable star. What the scientists have been able to conclude, though, is that the period of the brightening and the dimming of the star is actually directly proportional to their luminosity, which means that if you have a longer period, you have a higher actual luminosity. So using this, you measure the period because you can measure time, um, and then you calculate the actual luminosity. And as I said before, you compare that to the perceived luminosity from Earth, you get the distance, and then you know all the distance of the stars around it to the Earth. Another type of uh, standard candle is a type 1a supernovae. So a supernova involving a white dwarf, at the time of its explosion, the luminosity is always the same. So when that happens, we also automatically know how far away it is from us, and we know we can use that to measure the distance of the other stars around it. Then we have Wien's displacement law. So Wien's displacement law is very interesting. Here we talk about black bodies, um, and take an example of a black body as the sun, okay? And I'll explain what it is later. But the black body radiation curve for different temperatures peaks at a wavelength with a, which is inversely proportional to the temperature. So the lambda max is directly proportional to 1 over the temperature. What does this even mean? Well, first of all, black bodies are theoretical objects that totally absorbs all radiation that falls onto it and is a good emitter of radiation, too. Um, an example of a black body is the sun. We, you might have learned that the color black or darker colors absorb heat better and then release it better. Um, light colors like white reflect heat and it doesn't emit heat very easily. Imagine a type of color black, but it's so perfect that it totally absorbs all radiation that falls to it. That is what a black body is, and obviously it is theoretical, but the closest example to it we have are things like the sun. So from a certain black body, there is a certain characteristic spectrum of radiation because they emit radiation. And the spectrum of radiation looks something like this. We can see that there are different types of wavelengths and there are, there's an intensity. At a certain intense wavelength, the intensity peaks. So there is a certain type of wavelength that is emitted the most. So what Wien's displacement, this Wien's equation is actually telling us is that the, the certain type of wavelength at which the intensity is the maximum, which means it's emitted the most, this is actually inversely proportional to the temperature of the certain black body. So this graph kind of explains it all. 
if you have a temperature that's 6,000 kelvins, which is the highest temperature, you see that this peaks at the lowest wavelength. At lower temperatures, it peaks at a higher wavelength. And so this is why hotter stars tend to be white or blue, because blue has a lower wavelength. And cooler stars tend to be red or yellow, because red and yellow have a higher wavelength. And so that is Wien's equation, which is that, you know, the certain lambda max is directly pro inversely proportional to the temperature of the star. Now, there is a constant involved, and this constant we know, which is 2.9 times 10 to the power of negative 3 meters kelvins. So we can also conclude that the lambda max is 2.9 times 10 to the power of neg negative 3 divided by the temperature of the black body. So you might be thinking, that's a really peculiar graph. Why does the radiation from a black body look like this? So, and also another confusing thing is why does it go up and then come down? Why doesn't it keep going upwards? Well, the black body radiation is actually formed in three types of waves. Um, the first one, which is the most significant, is the vibration of atoms. When they are hot, the atoms vibrate a lot more, and they give to the excitation of electrons. When the electrons de-excite, the photons are going to be released, and the atoms are very close together. Um, so the possible excitation states actually merge, and the electrons have like extremely variegated excitation states, which is the reason why they emit wavelengths of all types. And so when we see it, we, it just looks like white light because all these different types of wavelengths have merged together. As you can see from here, there is like kind of like an infinite spectrum of wavelengths, right? It's a continuous spectrum of wavelengths. Another type of um, black body radiation is that polarized molecules also contribute to it. So this one, for example, H2O, they have a sort of polarization effect because there's more negative charge than positive charge on one side and the other. And so they kind of have like an electric field. Um, they have an electric or magnetic orientation. So every single time they move and they have a vibration, they will emit radiation because it starts an electromagnetic uh, variegation. And that basically creates a photon. The third type is the Bremsstrahlung radiation. And so the Bremsstrahlung radiation is something in x-rays as well. It's when the free electrons that have been freed through ionization because the molecules or the atoms were they had too much energy. Um, these free electrons actually exist on stars because the temperature is so high. They're going to bump into other molecules. And upon the rapid deceleration of these um, electrons, they're going to result in a photon being released. So this is all very interesting. And this explains a lot of why there is such a continuous spectrum, right? Um, I would also posit for certain things like these polarized mo molecules, the higher the rate of vibration, um, the lower the the higher the frequency will be, and hence the lower the wavelength will be of the emitted wavelengths. But these are actually very weak, so they're more likely to be like over here. Um, you might be wondering why does it peak and then go down? Well, this is because the type of photons that are emitted they're actually quantized, which means that you have to have a certain integer in the equation. So in the actual equation that describes the um, photon em emission, there is a certain part of it that's an integer, a whole number. And so that's why there are certain levels. And beyond this level, um, you don't emit anything anymore. And so because the photon emission is quantized, you know, after you pass a certain threshold, there's no photons emitted because there's just not that much energy. Next equation is the Stefan-Boltzmann law. And the Stefan-Boltzmann law tells us that the total energy emitted per second, which is luminosity as we know, per unit area of a black body is proportional to the absolute temperature of the body to the power of four. Now let's write that down. Um, so the luminosity per unit area and the unit area remember we have to use 4 pi r squared because this is a spherical thing it's not a square and then that is directly proportional to the temperature to the power of 4 and so if we rearrange that we get this equation and the constant is this one sigma so we know that the sigma 
is actually the Stefan Boltzmann constant, and this is equal to 5.67 times 10 to the power of negative 8 watts per meter squared per Kelvin to the power of 4. So that is pretty wild, but I think this makes a bit of sense because it is essentially telling us that the total power, in a way, um, per unit area is directly proportional to the temperature to the power of 4, but it is to be expected that there will be a positive correlation between the temperature and the luminosity. We also have the redshift of electromagnetic radiation. Um, so this redshift is actually evidence that our universe is expanding. Now I'm sure you guys all know the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect's equation is this, and this is when for longitudinal waves, when the observer stays still and then there is a body that's moving to or away from the observer, the observed frequency is going to differentiate. It's going to be varied um, according to this equation, and this is the speed of the source. So this is, you know, you know, previously we, you know, studied this for sound waves, but it also accounts for light waves because light waves are also uh, transverse waves. Did I say longitudinal before? Because it is transverse waves. So light also goes through this Doppler effect. And what we have been able to observe is that the light from very distant stars um, tend to shift towards the more red areas, and that's why we call it the redshift. And so the um, wavelengths essentially are getting stretched. When the wavelengths are getting stretched, it means that the bodies are moving away from us. So this is evidence that the universe is expanding because the light from the very distant stars tend to be stretched. Uh, so the equation for this is pretty simple. Delta lambda over lambda is delta frequency over frequency, which is, you know, the velocity of the certain object um, over the speed of the light. So Hubble's law tells us that the recession speed of galaxies moving away from Earth is proportional to their distance from Earth. What this tells us is that the further you are away from Earth, the faster you're moving away from us. And so the further you are away, your the rate of your recession basically increases when you move away from Earth. And so the equation that he came up with is that the, you know, the galaxy's recessional velocity, V, is equal to a constant times the dis distance between the galaxy and the Earth. And this constant over here is the Hubble's constant, which is the rate of the expansion of the universe. So the Hubble's constant is actually over here. The Hubble's constant is this. 2.4 times 10 to the power of negative 18. That's the Hubble's constant. Now, using the Hubble, like the Hubble's law, we can actually try to determine the age of the universe as well. Because we know that the velocity of recession is equal to this, right? At first, at the beginning of the universe, we can assume that the universe was all together it was really compact and as time increased the recession speed also increased and the distance between our galaxies also increased the velocity is actually the receded velocity over the time taken to recede and so we can cross these two out and we know the time taken to recede the total time taken to recede is actually one over h o which means that it is basically the inverse of the Hubble's constant. So when you do this, you get the fact that the time, the age of the, the whole universe is 4.167 times 10 to the power of 17 seconds. And if you convert that to years, you get 1.3 times 10 to the power of 10 years, which is around 13 billion years. And some scientists think that's closer to 14 billion years. So a lot of people are working on how to make the Hubble's constant as accurate as possible because it has serious implications, namely determining the age of our entire universe. So that's about it for all of the equations in A-level astrophysics. Um, here's a summary of it, which I think could be a little bit helpful. So we have a few main equations. First one is the inverse square law of flux. And as you know, this is inverse square law of flux. There's a flux radioactive flux intensity, and this is the one measured on Earth, is the luminosity divided by the area. Wien's displacement law tells us that, you know, for a black body radiation, the maximum lambda is 
direct inversely proportional to the temperature and actually the constant that's involved is this one 2.9 times 10 to the power of negative 3. The Stefan Boltzmann law tells us that the luminosity is actually directly proportional to the temperature of the black body to the power of 4 and you also have this so basically the luminosity divided by the area. Hubble's law tells us that the speed of recession is equal directly proportional to the distance between the two galaxies and the constant involved is the Hubble's constant. Using this we can get the age of the universe which is basically the reciprocal of the Hubble's constant and we have redshift as well which we can just use this very simple thing if they tell you you know the original the original the wavelength of the light that should be and they tell you that it is actually this one we can calculate the delta and you with that we can actually also calculate what's the speed at which it's receding away from us so those are all of the equations that you have in astrophysics i hope this video was helpful in any way and if you want more videos on a-level physics do check out the other videos on my channel thank you for watching